it assails his nostrils, brings tears to his clear blue eyes. The whole area is a blight on the face of New York. But it is also something else. This is home. Today on the Comic Book Report, The Thing Omnibus from Marvel Comics. Stick around and check it out. Greetings everyone, my name is Dominic and today you're tuning in to the Comic Book Report, where we review comic books and graphic novels so you can get an idea of what to read. And today I've got another Marvel Omnibus review for all of you, and of course we're talking about Mama Grimm's blue-eyed boy, The Thing. I'm so excited to jump into this series, but before we do, I just want to say a special thank you and shout out our channel sponsor, OrganicPriceBooks.com. If you're looking to pick up your own comic book collected editions, I highly encourage you to check out their website. You can find a link for it in the video description. If you find something you like, you can even use my discount code at checkout, The Comic Book Report, to save $2 off of your order. Please note if you use my affiliate code or link to make a purchase, I will earn a small commission, but it's a fantastic way to support this channel. Thank you so much for considering. Now let's get started with today's Omnibus Review. First, some quick facts about today's collection. The issues in this volume are written primarily by John Byrne, Mike Carlin, Bob Harris, and more, and illustrated primarily by Ron Wilson, John Byrne, and many more. The comics in this volume were first published by Marvel Comics beginning in 1983. The volume itself collects The Thing, the 1983 series, issues 1 through 36, Fantastic Four, issues 274, 277, and 296, Quest Probe, issue 3, Secret Wars 2, issue 7, West Coast Avengers, issue 10, Marvel graphic novel Hulk and Thing, The Big Change, Marvel Tales, issue 198, and material from Marvel Fanfare, issue 15, and Marvel Superheroes, issue 5. Finally, this is an oversized hardcover collection with glossy print paper stock, a sewn binding, and a total of 1,160 pages. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and issue a general spoiler warning. I will be flipping through the contents of today's collection and commenting on plot points throughout. You've been advised. Okay, and now let's go ahead and jump in. This is our first look at that oversized hardcover omnibus from Marvel. I will say this is the standard edition cover. There was a direct market as well. I'll try to throw up a quick snapshot for you. Uh, please note on the spines as well, which I'll show, there's a little bit of an image on the bottom of the thing. I believe in the direct market cover, there's also a different image there. Uh, but those are the only differences on the dust jacket that I'm aware of. As far as how this book is designed, I really like the dust jacket choices. I I think the direct market and the standard both look very sharp. Love, love, love the spine with the thing and the bright orange font. Very, very cool. Uh, the back of the volume as well really heavily favors the orange of the thing, which I think was a very smart choice. Like so many other Marvel omnibuses, we do have thumbnails of all of the issues included across the back. Really love that. I always think that that's a very, very good touch for these editions, and I certainly appreciated it here. And now I'd just like to take a minute to take a closer look at this dust jacket. I will also be showing you the interior flaps as well and spreading it all out so you can get a full picture of this dust jacket one final time. Again, I think the design is really great. I love that we had so much orange for the thing. It just makes sense. I'm so happy the marketing and design team capitalized on that. I just think it looks really sharp. Uh, then after that, we'll go ahead and take a look at the Under the Dust Jacket hardback book itself and the art we have printed on that. I do think in a really interesting twist, the book itself is predominantly a purple. I think that this is such a striking contrast to the orange of the thing, but I do find it surprising that we didn't get a straight up orange uh, hardback book, especially because the print of the different art on it is pretty minor. You know, I feel like they could have done the exact same thing with orange, uh, but here we are. And I do still think the purple looks quite nice. We definitely have a couple images of the thing throughout it kind of stamped on it. Uh, not really art from the book per se. I've Obviously, there's covers that this kind of prints here, uh, but it's definitely a fun design choice. I think overall it looks good. 
Okay, and now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the sewn binding for this omnibus. I will say this is a like thick book. It is a quite large book. I had trouble getting the pages to lie down totally flat, as you'll see as I flip through. Um, I think there is a little bit of gutter loss, but luckily this was still in an era where we had a lot of white border, so I didn't really notice anything that fell into the gutter that was too critical for my read, which I really appreciated. Overall, not too bad, and I think it was bound fairly well. Moving right along now, we can jump into the collection proper, and as we flip into the omnibus, we have a lot of great title pages, some publication information, and one of my favorite facets, a full table of contents with page numbers, we have the title of the issue, everything like that. I love it. I love a fully mapped book with a nice paged table of contents, and this book definitely gives it to me. And I think with an early 80s collection, it's not always guaranteed I see something like this, so I really, really loved that feature. After that, of course, we jump right into the issues with issue one of The Thing. I will say this is his first solo series that's self-titled The Thing from 1983. Uh, but before this, he was basically headlining his own series in Marvel 2-in-1, where he was kind of with some different Marvel heroes, things like that. My understanding is that rolled right into this thing number one. But I don't think you need to read any of that to enjoy this story. I think you can definitely read this as a starting point. I know that that's what I did. As far as how this came on my radar, I've been going through different Fantastic Four eras, and I'm currently going through John Byrne's era, and I am loving it. I think it's a great run so far, and I knew that there was a Thing solo kind of spin-off series that was happening concurrently with that run that had a lot written by John Byrne himself. When I heard there was an omnibus, I was eager to get a copy, so I was really happy to get this, uh, and I was just curious how it would line up or how I would feel about it. I am a John Byrne fan, and I I will say overall this is a very fun collection. A couple things about how it's set up though that I think that viewers should be aware of is that this book really does feel like three separate books. What do I mean by that? I mean there are two parts that are written by John Byrne and the final is mostly written by Mike Carlin with a couple other authors kind of strewn about in there. We also have the art changing hands a few times but I think there's a good amount of kind of visual fidelity which is fun. As far as the three sections I've outlined here, I'm going to call it the pre-Secret Wars thing. Basically, before the Marvel Superhero Secret Wars event, that huge crossover that I believe I reviewed on the channel already, basically this Thing solo series had already kicked off, so we have a handful of issues that is the Thing prior to that event. It's his exploits around New York. We have some really cool, like an issue or two with backstory. We have this one about his old girlfriend that is actually pretty fascinating. I think it lent a lot of great character depth to Ben Grimm, the Thing, which I just really liked. Uh, and these issues are kind of getting your feet wet. You kind of see how it feels having him headline his own solo series outside of the Fantastic Four. And overall, these issues were a ton of fun. I think they were really episodic, kind of one and done for the most part. There were overarching kind of themes or ideas like his relationship with the Leech Masters, for example. Uh, but overall, it's kind of a one and done adventure. And that goes along until the events of the Marvel Superhero Secret Wars. Uh, without spoiling too much, although I'm going to have to get into a little bit here, so spoiler alert. At the end of Secret Wars, Ben Grimm, the Thing, decides to stay behind in Battle World. So the Fantastic Four return to Earth, She-Hulk becomes a member of the Fantastic Four in the Thing's stead, and Ben Grimm is back on Battle World, trying to just kind of find himself, basically. Reed gives him this button that says, hey, at any time you can use this and it'll send you home. The reason he decides to stay on Battle World is he's able to turn between Ben Grimm in his human form and The Thing whenever he wants at will. He's no longer trapped as this, in his mind, monster form. And I think that this is a really compelling idea for the character. I love that this gets explored because this is like one of his deepest wishes to be his own man again not to be trapped in this rock monster of a body. Uh, so this is where we have the second whole portion of this book, the second third, and it's g this giant space opera, the uh, saga of Rocky Grimm Space Ranger is kind of what it's called, or just the adventures of, or whatever. Um, but it's still the thing title, and it's basically him going through Battle World after the event of Secret Wars, 
Most of the heroes and villains are gone, if not all. There are a couple interesting appearances. And Battleworld has a lot of weird mysteries. Like, some areas feel like they've been around for a long time. They kind of play with this idea that some of what happens in Battleworld is generated by his own thoughts or subconscious. Uh, we even have him finding a love interest of sorts in Terriana. And this is coming in at a really interesting time in his life where he's really evaluating his relationship with Alicia Masters. And does he go through with it? Or does he need to bow out because he's in endangering her and does he really still love her and he's dealing with all of that and in comes this new woman again in the person of Teriana. And so we have him going through battle world, we have him flying spaceships, going to medieval looking castles, facing off against Dracula and the Wolfman and Frankenstein, uh, a whole like underground community of other thing like creatures. Uh, it's just such an otherworldly kind of sci-fi fantasy landscape and it's really fascinating. This all does build to kind of ultimate confrontation with this uh, kind of like villain that's been in the shadows for most of his time in battle world. You find out it is the the human uh, embodiment of Ben Grimm. It's like the other kind of ego persona he has. And we have the thing versus Ben Grimm. And it's just really this epic uh, climatic final battle. There are other bits in this era too, like with Ultron and just so much happens in this period. Uh, but anyway, that leads into the third portion of this omnibus, which brings him back to New York. And a few more spoilers here. When he goes back to New York, he's thinking about possibly breaking it off with Alicia because he's had time to find himself. He finds out that Teriana was you know, not totally real, maybe a manifestation of his subconscious, and she kind of dies on Battle World, and he's kind of wrecked by that, and anyway, he comes home, though, to find that the Human Torch, Johnny Storm, is in a relationship with Alicia Masters, is allegedly in love with her. Uh, we also have a shocking revelation toward the end of his time at Battle World that he was actually always able to change form between the Thing and Ben Grimm, but what has held him back is subconsciously he thought that if he was human, Alicia wouldn't love him. And so he always prevented himself mentally from doing that. And there's an insinuation at the end of this and the beginning of his journey back in New York that Reed Richards stumbled across this and knew the whole time and didn't tell his friend. Why that's even more critical other than being deceptive is the fact that at the end of his time in Battleworld, he kills Ben Grimm or kind of stops him. And so he eliminates that, that human only part of him forever, presumably. So now he's for sure trapped as the thing back on Earth and he's miserable. His girl is with someone else. He feels betrayed by his friend Reed Richards as well and he's just a mess and so he decides I don't want to be in the Fantastic Four anymore and the whole last third of the book he's kind of going off to do his own thing and find what life looks like outside of the Fantastic Four of course he tangles with a bunch of notable villains and all of these other kind of episodic adventures as he kind of hops around uh, the United States he also gets a bunch of odd jobs a couple notable appearances are at time at a carnival he becomes kind of a dirt bike daredevil kind of figure and then ultimately lands in a big portion of the back of this book and kind of ultimate fighter wrestling uh, league basically where there's like a no power limit wrestling league and he's in this for a long time this has plot points for like the back third of the omnibus and ultimately, this omnibus culminates with him joining back up with the Fantastic Four. Uh, we get a cool Marvel graphic novel at the end as well. Anyway, that's kind of how the series is laid out. Like I said, the first two bits, like the early thing issues in New York, and everything in Battle World is all John Byrne. And then the last third is mostly Mike Carlin. Uh, I will say that the continuity as far as the writing style, I wasn't too jarring as I jumped from one to the other. I did probably prefer the John Byrne era. Uh, I think fans of professional wrestling, though, will definitely like that last third bit. I think for me, that just took such an interesting swing I did not expect, so I thought that was a little bit different uh but yeah overall it was a really fun omnibus i feel like it covered so much ground the fact that this occurred during the john byrne fantastic four era and had the marvel superhero secret wars event right in the middle it's a really dynamic time for marvel comics for fantastic four and especially our blue-eyed thing so this is a really gripping time in his history and frankly i really enjoyed my time 
I went over a few bits here. I'm just going to kind of speak generally about the book, maybe highlight some of my favorite stories. Uh, we're approaching the period where we're, I'm talking about when he battles some of the universal monsters. Basically, at one point in Battle World, he gets separated from Teriana. He's by himself, and he stumbles across basically Dracula's castle, and he's like, what the heck's going on here? For me, this was a really important pivotal moment in his time on Battle World as well, because this is where we start to realize that this whole landscape is even more screwy than we initially thought, and there might be some some underpinnings of Ben having some agency in controlling this world because it gets outlandish and it borrows some stuff in his head like the monsters you know so we have Dracula we also have like the mummy and Frankenstein and the wolfman and it's just a really interesting uh, story. I think being a fan of the Universal Monsters, I did really love seeing these issues or this issue or two that has these monsters. Love the art style we get throughout these couple issues too. I think it's super fun for any classic Universal Monster fan. Uh, and I just thought that it was fun that it was included here. I had no idea there was issues on this and I was just fascinated. Uh, and I think that that fascination is definitely a defining feature of my experience reading this book. Like I said, I'm going through John Byrne's Fantastic Four. This came out in the early 80s, so you know these issues are a bit dated by today's standards, but I still think that they have modern flourishes, and they're still very accessible, especially compared to maybe uh, Silver or Golden Age comic book storytelling. I am fond of those as well, but this does feel a bit more uh, contemporary than something like that, uh, but it's still a bit dated, and I think that because of that, I didn't really know what I was going to get here, but I ended up really enjoying it. I think the way they were doing comics here was super fascinating as well as far as the panel layouts we still have a lot of just kind of boxy shapes you know we do have some splash pages some spread pages but for the most part everything's very geometric and boxy we don't have a ton of the wild experimentation with paneling uh, like we do once we hit things like Todd McFarlane in the 90s uh, but I still thought that the panel layouts were really fresh and interesting I think the art we got from like I said John Byrne and some of these other guys was all very sharp um, I just I enjoyed it I think it was great art throughout I think having the battle world portion in the middle of this book as well was a really interesting way to break up the book because it felt like we would get in a groove of what the Thing series was really about and then it would have this huge titanic shift, you know? First it's these grounded character stories in New York following the Thing, then we have this outlandish space opera for a while, and then we have him kind of on the outs, traveling across America, finding odd jobs, ending up in professional wrestling. Like, all of these eras of the Thing had such a distinct feel feel and that's why I feel like this can be broken into really three different acts or books uh, but ultimately I love that we have all of it under this one tome I think it's a really fantastic collection and it definitely is something unique you know it feels very different than Fantastic Four I had honestly never read a thing solo series like this um, and I wasn't sure initially like how well is he going to hold the title on his own I know, too, that there have been other Marvel 2-in-1 series with The Thing, and I know that, like, The Human Torch had his own series, I believe, for a while. I know that they had Fantastic Four and The Future Foundation as separate titles. So I know that there's been spinoffs and derivatives of Fantastic Four, but this proper titled Thing series was the first big spinoff foray, I believe, with these characters. Uh, and honestly, I think it works, and I think that he has enough going for his character and enough internal tension, drama, sense of conflict, and even character depth that it was really great having him as my protagonist for the whole way through. There's times where he's brash, impatient, hot-headed, and there's times where he's very moving and contemplative, and I love that we're just there for the whole ride. Uh, like I said, the art is great. I will say, uh, once we get out of Battle World, I did have to kind of reset my expectations all over again, and I think I initially thought we were going to get back to some of the more character-grounded stories we got from John Byrne at the beginning, uh, but Mike Carlin had a whole different energy. It was still the thing... Uh, kind of finding himself and dealing with a lot of fallout, dealing with a lot of like crisis of, uh, you know, relationships, especially with his, his girlfriend, with his best friends in the Fantastic Four. And we're at, we're seeing the thing stretched in a way that he really never has been before. And it led to just some really interesting uh, kind of avenues for storytelling. I like this feeling like he's just kind of road tripping or walking across the country. I liked him kind of stumbling into random adventures or odd jobs along the way. Um, I think 
that that just really worked for a character like the thing you know in a way it reminds me of the old bill bixby hulk series where he's kind of this wandering drifter and he'd walk in solve a problem but ultimately he has to keep um, keep a move on you know it kind of felt similarly for a moment uh and ultimately we end up camping out with that professional wrestling thing i mentioned before one wrinkle i should talk about is that the thing actually meets a woman who looks exactly like teriana his sort of love interest from battle world and this woman ends up being part of that dirt biking uh troop and ultimately ends up in this sort of wrestling adjacent area with him and she becomes her own new miss marvel uh so that's a whole other fascinating wrinkle toward the end of this collection she doesn't really have a romantic relationship with the thing even though the thing wants one it's much more of a fr- friendship in her eyes anyway it's just an interesting kind of rebound relationship like what's going on here is their fate is their destiny why does she look so much like her what's going on uh, and there's not a ton of resolution in that plot line, but we have another, like I said, superhero origin with that Miss Marvel, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, but yeah, a really interesting collection here. I think what I like too is toward the back of this book, we'll get there momentarily. We have a couple issues of other series. Um, you know, like we have a, I believe a Fantastic Four issue, like a 25th anniversary that ends up being really cool. We have Stan Lee writing a little bit on that. That has to do with the Mole Man. I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but we also have a West Coast Avengers issue. We have this really cool Marvel graphic graphic novel with the Hulk and the Thing, and all of these boast some different artists, some different writers in a way, Um, but I really like that the book ended with this because we got a lot more variety, uh, and it breaks away from just sort of that professional wrestling subplot that ended up dominating a few issues, and honestly, I liked it. I really liked that we had this resolution of the thing kind of rejoining the fantastic four uh but before that we actually have the thing beginning to mutate and become someone more a little bit more monstrous or mutated we don't have a full uh, fruition of that in this book but that is where the thing issues kind of stop at issue 36 in this book uh and that segues into the west coast avengers where he was going to join the west coast avengers they come looking for him but he ends up kind of just wandering on and saying hey i'm gonna leave you guys i gotta figure my stuff out and that culminates with that fantastic four issue that's the 25th anniversary special it's an extra long issue where we actually have the thing go to like monster island go underground and become best friends with the mole man who was the fantastic four's first villain all the way back in fantastic four issue one and we have him basically befriending the mole man uh the rest of the fantastic four are worried about him go to the monster island and it's sort of the fantastic three versus the thing and the mole man for a while the thing's kind of trying to defuse his old friends saying hey the surface world's where you belong ugly monsters like me belong down here with the mole man and all these creatures um but we have the mole man having this insidious plot ben's not sure who to trust and ultimately mole man ends up mutating johnny storm and making him kind of monstrous the thing tries to revert him and anyway it's this huge adventure and i love that it's a throwback to the first issue of fantastic four i think inviting stan lee to come back on to script it was such a just master stroke and such a consideration and frankly it's a really great story and one of my favorites toward the end of this book flipping through it now uh after this issue though we essentially get to the um marvel graphic novel hulk and thing the big change and this is another really fun one i think the art is really beautiful in this it has a kind of painted look for it and it really is a jarring contrast to everything that's come before in this omnibus and i think it it lends a refreshing sense of variety to the art at least really love the inclusion here essentially this story is the hulk and the thing kind of get abducted to this sort of alien planet and they basically been uh drafted into this uh let's call it an assignment from this race of alien creatures and ultimately they kind of give them this sort of deal of hey if you do this action for us the two of you you can get a wish kind of like a genie wish whatever you want and so you know the thing is thinking hey i can wish to be human and the the guy even shows him like yep i have the power to do that he shows him for a minute uh the hulk's thinking that hey i'll get a good time and maybe some free food that's going to be my wish And so the two of them get set loose on this adventure, and it's just kind of this weird buddy comedy sci-fi. It's not overly long, you know, it's a pretty good size, but it's nothing crazy, and maybe like a double issue wide length. Um, But it's a fun, zippy little sort of science fiction comedy, 
and ultimately it culminates with the Hulk using both wishes to basically get free food and to go home, and they don't even get to wish for something really meaningful, like, you know, turning human again, and the thing's really mad, but anyway, just a really great story, and I love that we have a couple just heavy hitter issue things at the back of this book. It really kind of left the collection on a really high note for me, between having that Fantastic Four special and the Marvel graphic novel with the Hulk and the Thing. I just thought it was a really, really cool piece or selection of issues to have at the back. After that, we really just have two more issues or like an issue and a half. We have a couple materials of like a Thing and Spider-Man and then just a small little story at the very end. I think the last two inclusions were less important to me. I much preferred the Fantastic Four and the uh, Hulk and Thing graphic novel. Uh, But the last two pieces here really round out the collection. Uh, And then we go into um, essentially the extras at the back of the book. We have a couple different kind of covers, some information about the Thing, some kind of behind the scenes stuff. Really love all of the like kind of reprinted images and kind of archival pieces at the back of the book i would have liked even more extras frankly but i think we get a good amount here you know i was not dissatisfied with it you never really know what you're going to get with an omnibus as far as the extras go and i was happy to still get some here for the thing Um, but overall it was a really well-made omnibus collection like i said it feels like a thicker book and i think because we shift the narrative style and the kind of whole uh leaning of the plot lines for this book at least three separate times it feels so much bigger than I think the collection even is. Uh, So this feels like a more dense read. I really got to take my time with it, and I really just enjoyed the ride from cover to cover. Sure, not every issue was as good as the other. There is a bit of a variety of quality in this book, but overall, the general impression and kind of taste this left in my mouth was this was a very fun reading experience. I think for fans of the Fantastic Four, or especially the character of The Thing, this is probably a read you're going to want to pick up. If you enjoy comic books from the 80s, especially from Marvel, I think this is definitely a fun one that's just off the beaten path a little bit from some of the classics. Uh, But yeah, definitely enjoyed my time here. And with that, we've reached the end of this Omnibus collection. Can you believe it? And I think all that's left to do now is to give the Thing Omnibus from Marvel Comics a grade. For a very fun collection of solo Thing stories all happening during the events and after the events of the Marvel Superhero Secret Wars, the Comic Book Report is going to give the Thing Omnibus from Marvel Comics a B minus. I definitely think this is an above average read. I think as a Fantastic Four fan and a Thing fan, this is something closer to a must read for me. I think for the general public, there might be some hits here, but I think if this isn't really in your niche of collecting, if you don't like Marvel Secret Wars or you couldn't really care less about the Fantastic Four, this might be something skippable for you. I personally really liked it. I really enjoyed having this time kind of delving into these early 80s issues, following a character I genuinely enjoy. Some great sci fi elements here some fun characters here definitely one i'm going to recommend and remember but perhaps i missed the mark or you have a really different opinion definitely let me know in the comments below or let me know what you think of this book or maybe some of the other books i mentioned in the review thank you so much for watching and until next time this has been the comic book report please don't forget to leave this video a like that comment we talked about and maybe check out one of my other videos on your way out thanks and have a good one